plenty of seats on that side of the room, so move over, take a seat, so you can enjoy the final part. A last one, but definitely not least. So the times, they are changing, and the same goes for our annual award ceremony. This year, we will not hand out the Fairware Best Practice Award, but instead, we hand out the Fairware Foundation Inspiration Award. Yes, because we want to support all members in their efforts to create impact and showcase their results. And um, we have shortlisted three entries, and all the cases that I'm about to introduce are inspiring, offer valuable insight, and encourage thinking beyond the norm. Now, this year, we've switched back to having you vote the winner. So, the case, the approach that receives the most votes today will get the Fairware Inspiration Award, but also receive a video profile of their approach, which is a great communication tool to promote CSR to both consumers, but also even a wider audience. Now, before I introduce the three shortlisted entries, we'd like to take a moment to look at last year's winner, Schijvend. They weren't able to be here today, but here it goes. Oh. <laughs> This is Shirley Skyvens, the director of the family-run company Skyvens in Hilfarenbeek, the Netherlands. Skyvens started in 1863. We produce uh, workwear and uniforms, so we made all the uniforms for the Dutch customers in our own building. But nowadays we decided to move to other countries because the price you pay here for wages in Holland, it's not doable anymore. So Skyvens took their production to other European countries and Asia. I think it's uh, 2016, then we decided to buy our own factory again because we really miss the entrepreneurship in the textile business. In Mersin, Turkey, Skyvens found a like-minded partner in the Dutch-owned factory UFS. If you have been a producer yourself, you can see how the people are working, but then suddenly you are not producing in your own house anymore. That's a really, really tricky thing. You can say, okay, as long as I don't know, then it, it's okay. Well, that's not really in our DNA. At Schijvens, we are really involved. So we all think that they are colleagues as well. So the Schijvens team worked hard to improve labor conditions for all of their colleagues in Mersin. Together with the factory, they made sure that all factory employees would receive a proper wage. We first uh, asked Fairware to help us. On the other hand, we asked the workers, what do you need for a salary? What do you need for medicine? What do you need for education? So they all took home the list and they brought it back to the factory, simple as that. Skyvens calculated that the workers needed a salary increase of 500 Turkish lira per worker. Uh, it's easy to make this project work because it's our own factory. However, we decided not to stop there, but to move forward with also the factories we don't own because we still have 75% of our production in other factories around the world. So I think within a year, we also have the living wage in Pakistan in our factory. It's our responsibility as a human being to think about these things not only as an owner of a company, but in general, everybody should do that. Yes, as I said, they couldn't be here today, but they, um, they of course, have received this video and they are, they are really excited to um, to using this video as a perfect communication tool. So we'll probably hear more about that, how they're going to use it. Okay, now it's time to introduce the three shortlisted entries. Can I please ask to come on stage, Vaude, represented by Sven. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Or 
Ortovox, represented by Stephanie and Katrien. I'm correct. <laughs> Welcome. And last but not least, Hagloves, together with Outdoor and Sports Company, represented by Eva and Kevin. <laughs> All right, I'll go to this side. Congratulations on this nomination. As I said, you all um, have actually explained to us a very inspirational and um, valuable approach. And I would now like to ask you to present the case, because I didn't explain anything about the case yet, because we want you to explain to us and to elaborate on your case. So you each get five minutes to tell us more about your case in the way you want to. And after each presentation, we have time for questions. So my sidekick, Michael, will run around and uh, with the mic to um, give you the opportunity to ask questions. So um, Sven, can I ask you to start? <laughs> <laughs> I've never used such a device, so I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> Okay, okay, first of all, I want, want you all to lean back, relax, sit, sit, sit comfortable, because I want to take you out on a journey. Push me off, man. Because for us, our project feels actually like a journey. About one year ago, we sat together with our Asian team and we discussed the current status of our monitoring system. We assessed that in terms of social compliance, we were quite good in tier one supply chain due to our Fair Foundation membership, and in the tier two, supply chain, we, were, we took the first steps in terms of chemical and environmental management, uh, um, environmental topics due to our environmental stewardship project. And within this project, we went together with our 10 biggest fabric suppliers and we offered them hands-on guidance, how to implement a reasonable management system for, for chemicals, for, for energy, water, waste, and so on. So, we said, okay, this was quite good. This was quite good to make the first experience. But we also realized that this can't be, this can't be it. We wanted to go further, and we said, we want to introduce a comprehensive mo um, vendor management system. First of all, to create transparency throughout our supply chain. The second point was to learn about the conditions and the challenges in our supply chain. And the third point was, to enhance the cooperation and together finding solution how we can tackle those challenges. Okay, in the beginning of our journey, the first step was to convince our general management and somehow to get through to their pot of gold because we had great ideas, but we needed money to finance it. Fortunately, they are pretty excited about sustainability, so this was not much of a problem. Instead, just go ahead, do it. The second step, which was a bit harder to achieve, was actually to sit down and really um, write down our vision. What do we want to achieve and how we want to get there? So really to say, what is our approach? And in this step, in this process, we developed a performance check process. It's basically an on-site checking tool consisting, consisting of uh, environmental and social indicators based on international standards, approved, for example, by Ferro Foundation. And with this, we, sent, uh, we, want, we intended to send our teams out, go into the factories, and really give them hands-on guidance, because we also defined performance levels. We said, so we can sit together, we can say, hey, you perform in this indicator, you perform like this. If you want to improve, or, if, or we see a need to improve, then you have to do these steps to reach the next level, which will also have, in the end, implications for the sourcing volume. So this is inter interconnected. And the third point, and probably the most thrilling point, was to get all of our partners on board. So in, we invited all of them, all our strategic partners, to our head office. We took the time, we explained our visions, and we explained the way how we want to get there. And it was a very curious incident, because one guy stood up on the crowd and he said, I want to know what's in for me. I want to know what my benefits from participating in this project. And we said, well, First of all, we want to help you to take the perspective of your staff. We need to focus on the satisfaction of your workforce and find ways how to improve their motivation and how to improve their productivity. The second thing is, as we all know, that the environmental and social legislation in sourcing countries is getting stricter and stricter. We want to give you the chance to act before those 
regulations are introduced instead of reacting in the end and be in danger that your factory facilities close down. And the third point is that we realize that there are more and more brands who want to take their responsibility in the whole supply chain seriously. And we want you to bring you up, to bring you on a level that you can offer services, that you can really open up your production and show to customers, say, we stand for our production, we are proud of it, and we don't have anything to hide. So, and we were really happy about the outcome of this um, vendor meeting because a lot of our partners said, hey, we want to volunteer, we want to invite you to our factory, and we want to have this performance check and want to help you to improve it. And this is actually where the fun part begins. So in September this year, we conducted the first eight factory performance evaluations in the um, fabric and trim supply chain in Taiwan. And for most of our partners, this was the first social and environmental audit they ever experienced. So it was also very thrilling to them. And the initially, the first results were quite promising because more of our partners than we expected are really aware of the situations of the worker. They really want to improve something and they really, but sometimes they struggle a bit. On the other side, we realized that the situation of migrant worker from Philippines, from from um, Vietnam, from Indonesia, is really a matter of high concern, and we need to find immediate in, imminent solutions to, this, to, this, to, to um, improve the situation. This, on the other hand, in terms of environmental aspects, we, we are very really proud of what we have achieved so far, because together with our, with, with our partners, we could implement measures to save 500, 500 tons of waste. 500, oh, wait. 500 tons of waste. I learned this by heart and now it's hard to remember. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> so, 500,000 cubic inches of water and 80 million kilowatt hours of energy and this per year from now on. So this was really remarkable. And what made me even more proud than this mere figures what that we created a space for our, for our partners to exchange knowledge, to present their best practices and really, even though they are competitors, to see that they have to work together to really improve or bring the, the whole industry forward. So, now standing on this stage, and as this is an inspiration award, I would like to inspire you to start your own journey. It holds a lot of obstacles, and at the same time, it holds a lot of moments where you think, what the fuck are they thinking, or what's going on there, why they don't do it as we expect it to do. On the other hand, there's a huge, huge potential to improve your partnerships, to get closer to your partners, and to shape the supply chain according to your expectations, and make it fit for the future. So, my call for you is, get up, get out, and start your own journey, and the most important thing is, be excited where it will take you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sven. Are there any questions okay, so for Vaude? If so, ah. raise your hand. Yeah. What questions do we have for Vaude? Yeah, yeah. No. No. Um, yeah, re really inspiring. Um, are there any uh, because you're, you're talking about bringing all the suppliers together and exchanging knowledge, what were the most like remarkable things that were shared or that were were you know that led to improvements or potential improvements? It was um, actually it was most about technical solutions. So how to challenge the the problem of waste, how to, the sl sludge treatment, wastewater treatment problems, and we in our approach was that we invited them to say, hey, we really saw on site that you have a really um, best available technical solution on site. Would you be open to present it to the others to show what you've achieved? And in this, there, there was no competition because technical things are always a bit. It, I feel, it, from it, my experience, suppliers it, can be a bit uh, about. But um, it took us. It, it took us a while to open them up. We also said, okay, it, it's up to you. You decide if you want to participate. But it, it would be an honor for us if you would present your approach and share it with others and. And it was actually after those meetings, there were always, a, after those presentations, there was also a crowd around the presenter asking, hey, we want to visit you. Hey, can you tell us more about this? So we really um, felt that 
sharing experiences and realizing that you are, have faced the same challenges really brings them together and makes them open, opening up. Stand by. There's another question. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as the biggest benefit for workers uh, through such initiatives at the supplier factories, and have you already seen benefits? The biggest benefit is that there's someone el some external <laughs> external point view on the production setting. So if you work in a factory for or own a factory for 30, 40 years, you think that how th the things are running like they should run. And if they open up to us, if they commit to work together with us, and if they share the vision to, to create a more sustainable supply chain, we, we want to present ourselves as help to them. We want to say, we don't judge you. We won't um, break <coughs> up a business relationship if we find something that is non-compliant similar to the Fairer Foundation approach, so we learned a lot from Fairer Foundation. But we want to help you to get more, to, uh, to increase worker satisfaction. We really want to help you change the point of view with which you look at your production setting and help to give you new impulses to reconsider certain things. So, of course, we are still at the beginning, but I think this is a stepwise approach really to um, shape the point of view of management. And at the same time, we're also thinking about how we can better uh, integrate local stakeholders in our monitoring system and, and bring them in as support or an, as a kind of consultation. Mm -hmm. I just left that spot. That's OK. <laughs> Hi, that was uh, very inspiring, thank you. Uh, I just had a question, so do you, do you see any problems with leverage? Like, w was that to your advantage, or did you experience any problems with maybe if you were a small player? Just curious about that side of the things. So in the, in the big uh, part of outdoor brands, we are rather small light. And we thought our approach is that we want to be transparent about our vision, transparent about the way we want to go, and the benefits we think it will hold for, or the advantages it will hold for our partners to team up with us. So we don't go over, we don't go over um, economical or leverage. We say we want to support you, we want to help you also be a tr an attractive employ employer, in especially in countries where, where there is a scarcity of workforce. So we want to help to uh, make them fit for future. That is our approach, not saying, hey, we are big, we, have, we tell you you have to do this, but we want them to be committed and, best case, intrinsically motivated to join us. Thank you. OK, Faudé, thank you so much. You. Now, before we move on to Ortovox for the second uh, presentation, um, if you um, are listening to the uh, pitches, I can call them pitches, pitches, right? Then please keep the following factors in mind when considering who to vote for. First of all, is it scalable? That means, is it not limited by a ge geographical location or maybe a specific uh, uh, supplier or product group? Uh, secondly, is it effective? And thirdly, is it scalable? Can it be replicated across more suppliers or scenarios? So that's good to keep in mind while continuing to listen. Now the floor is for Ortovox. Yes. Yay. Yes. I got it back. <laughs> Friendship. Friendship is one of Autovox's core brand values. Friendship for us means long-lasting business relationships. We had already worked with Young for several years before he decided to start his own business. We decided to support this step because we were always very impressed by Young's out-of-the-box thinking. And again, he impressed us by introducing something very simple but yet so different. The five-day work week in Vietnam. But what does that mean? It means only working five days a week instead of six. Workers have four hours less in total per week, 
while earning the same salary. And the weekends are now free to spend with their families. But who, honestly, who am I to tell you about all this? Let's talk to our business partner and friend, Young. Hello, Young. Uh, I'm so happy to meet you, you guys. It was very nice to meet you. Young, thanks for being here today. Your idea of introducing a five-day week is very innovative, we think. Could you tell us how this idea grew? I think I need to give a little bit of background of myself to explain that. You know, um, I, used to, I used to work in Korea, then I moved to Vietnam um, 11 years ago. Then one of the most difficult things was, was to adjust myself to uh, a six-day six work per week in Vietnam. So then I really wanted to have five-day work, and when I, if I start my own business, was kind of part of that kind of the story that I really came up with the, this idea. But Yang, you told me that there was more behind it all. Um, what's the reason, um, what's the idea for the workers behind the five days? Well, the idea was, you know, when I was here in Vietnam, that actually no one, no, no, no other manufacturers did the uh, five day work per week. And then I, um, then we, I saw that the many, the workers, they leave, like uh, they, they work one year, then leave, then some new guys come back. So kind of, this is one of the, the, the reason that I really brought this in, in to K and K to have very low rate of turnover. At the same time, I wanted to give them kind of opportunity to enjoy the longer weekend so that we can keep that, you know, the workers for many, many years and, you know, to have better life. So this was a new concept for many people. How did the workers deal with this completely new situation? When I started this, then many of the, my employees were confused that because they never had this experience before, then, you know, then they are, it seems that they are not really happy when it started. Then they are, I also had a misunderstanding that I pay less than, you know, we, we work less than actually was not. Then later they understood this. That was kind of a little bit difficult thing. Oh, that's interesting. How did they react when they really understood what the new working conditions mean for them? What happened? After the first one month, they realized, oh, this, this is something really good. Then, you know, then they, they look so happy, like every Friday. Then <laughs> now it's really, uh, the people really excited about having a longer weekend now. So we, we really um, have good uh, relationship with the, uh, the employees and they, they really have good life here. And I'm so happy to see them they have a good life, a happier life. A visionary idea for Vietnam. I'm sure there were some critical voices. They, 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 they actually, they talked to me that, oh, you make so much money that you have, you know, you just give more time to employees, then you pay more because, you know, Eventually, it worked less. So, but I said, no, no, you can see good productivity because there are, you, you, you can keep skillful workers for a long time, then your productivity is really going up. So you can actually kind of trade off, no problem at all. All right, so if you had to put it in two or three sentences, what are your ideas for the future in your business? What's your recommendation? What's your vision? Life is too short to work with really trash people. <laughs> and so means that actually I really want to uh, the, give an opportunity to my employees um, kind of enjoy their happy life. And also at the same time, 
I want to really uh, make my customers happy, which means that actually we keep good workers for many, many years. Then it actually it can really uh, make Autobox product better, okay. nicer. Then we can you know work together for a long time as a uh, as a partnership. This is my vision. Thank you, Young. The five day week. <laughs> The five-day week is good for Autobox. It is good for the management, but it is especially good for the workers. So please today, vote for Young, vote for friendship, vote for an inspirational idea, because we do things, the times, they are changing. Thank you so much. And then last but not least, Haglifts together with... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm all like caught up in this excitement that I forget your questions. Wow. Are there any questions? I'm sure there are, but Michael. Yeah, well, I don't have one, but maybe somebody else does. Yeah, Yeah. Go. Thank you. Um, have you seen an improvement in the turnover of workers in the factory already? So is there like a less of a turnover now? We talked to Young because it was his idea and his feedback is that people really enjoy working there, that they stay there. And it even happened that they, like, they quit when um, the five-day week was introduced because they um, understood it wrongly, as he said, and they returned to the factory because they learned from, the, from their fellow workers what the idea behind it is. And his feedback to us is that the turnover has improved a lot. Yeah, another yep. question. Same table, easy. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, pitch. Um, my question is how does this all relate to um, overtime hours that were potentially distributed then over five days instead of six? Did that have any impact? Was it part of the discussion? Uh, how did you deal with that? We had the um, factory audited in November and they did not have any over our issues at that moment, and I do think that it also relates very much to the manager's perspective and the, the, to the manager's set of mind, because he really is in favor of keeping, keeping the work satisfaction, uh, worker satisfaction very high, as it is a very competitive field for the factories right now in Vietnam. And as far as I understood, um, this is his USP, like this is um, for the competition, that's his advantage. Um, to keep worker satisfaction high. So no, there was no issues. Mm -hmm. yep. Go ahead. So I just to clarify a follow-up question. So yeah. the, you mentioned there were four working uh, hours less because of moving the Saturday to a five-day uh, mm -hmm. working week. So the other was the other four hours then added to the five days? or It is, did they one, it is one hour more work per day. Okay. Yes, um, and it did take a couple of months for the people to adjust to that idea, and there was really like people were very unhappy because they had to um, to adapt their schedules at home. So it is a lot of change, but overall the impact is very positive, and the overall reaction after a couple of months also with the workers is that they want to do that, and they also talk tell their fellow workers about it. And I think a very positive thing for that is um, when we talk about yeah, things being scalable, um, we told our other producers about it. And they are quite interested in the concept because they do have the problem that workers are leaving the factory as soon as another opportunity opens up. Thank you. One last question over there. Thanks. Uh, I would like to know what is the uh, impact on the status of the complaint from the workers because of such improvement? Do you see the difference uh, before such uh, you know, um, uh, change uh, in less working hours? Or have you... Re there were, like... I, uh, have do you, you mean whether... We, whether we, I mean, he started the business less quite... Complaints like, or, or, uh, as fairware brands, uh, you, you 
I assume that you have this hotlines and then yeah, we do. receive the complaints from the workers in general. So do you see any difference after that uh, changes? Uh, is, is there any impact uh, on the status of the complaints? Is more positive? Well, uh, it's hard for us to judge because we didn't have any complaints the last couple of years. Oh. <laughs> so. That's great. <laughs> That's great. That's what I want to know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hagloves and OSC, the floor is yours. Thank Good you luck. Very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. And me? And me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to set the scene, and I need your help to do that. If you want to close your eyes, clear your mind. Don't go to sleep, and I'm not going to hypnotize you. OK? Just imagine that you are a worker in one of our factories, and you have garments, the back of you, the side of you, the front of you. It's very, very hot. Your hands are really hurting. And you've been working without any holiday, sorry, any day off for the last month. Because no one listens and no one cares. You've also done probably 60 to 70 hours overtime in the same month because no one listens and no one cares. Are you feeling how that is? Because I don't think anyone in this room would know what that feels like. You get paid at the end of the month, but you don't understand the wage sheet. You don't know whether you're being paid overtime because no one's listening and no one cares. And your life isn't your own. You're being run by the factory. Because no one listens and no one cares. And as brands, we're in factories where we could be one fish in a massive pond. And I tell you, no one listens and no one cares. But in the case of Eva and I, we became a shoal of fish. And the pond got a lot smaller. And the factory listened and the factory cared. You want the rest of it? You're introducing yourself. Sorry, my name is Kevin Offer and I'm from OSC. <laughs> <laughs> and this is. And my name is Eva Mullins and work for Scandinavia or Swedish outdoor brand Hoglöfs. Uh, and we would like to present something that didn't really start out as a really great project, such as the one that Faudé has initiated. Neither did it start as a great friendship and a brilliant idea, such as Ortovox is to actually go in and collaborate for a completely new system. So I applaud you on your efforts, really. Ours actually started as a, a challenge to be overcome. And our... Uh, our aspiration to, uh, you know, inspire you to do the same and win this inspirational award is the fact that we have been collaborating with a lot of different brands to actually improve our leverage far beyond our own brand or our combined forces, but actually uh, across the globe, uh, to different continents and to other auditing systems. Um, in, uh, let me set the scene, okay? Not like Kevin, but there was actually uh, two complaints coming in from a factory of ours that we both work at in China, uh, in the Tianjin area. Uh, it came to our knowledge that there has been unauthorized subcontracting to not only one factory, but a multitude of factories. Uh, and how one factory can outsource to so many factories without, you know, signs of this is, of course, alarming. But we decided then and there we need to do something about this. Uh, and at this factory, our joint leverage was roughly uh, 10 to 15 percent, depending on the month. Uh, but we also got uh, contact with four other brands across the globe, uh, ranging from Kathmandu in uh, New Zealand, to uh, Columbia Sportswear in the United, Na uh, United States uh, and other major retailing uh, or producing brands that were producing at the same factory. So here we are now, we are six brands 
across the globe collaborating uh, with a leverage that approaches 70 or 80 percent a month. And this is what's really inspiring about this challenge that we needed to overcome. With the outsourcing, we said, you cannot outsource, you need to insource. So they insourced, and what do you think happens? Well, over time, blew out, of course. So with the help of uh, communicating all the six different brands from different angles, using both an audit by Ferro Foundation in April 2018, but also an audit by, uh, initiated by FLA, with Elevate during May this year, and then a follow-up with repeat visits at the factory in uh, May, in June, in July, September, August, uh, and also one now in October. We've actually seen that we have done significant improvements. To be able to install attendance machines so that the workers can actually get their time registered properly. How much overtime are you actually doing? Are you getting paid for this? by introducing a new payslip sheet where you specify these are norm normal working hours, these are overtime hours, for the factory management to actually know how much the workers were working too much. Um, by uh, uh, getting them to, to, to push the factory to hire a nominated CSR staff and a HR manager within the course of weeks of the collaboration starting, uh, with the new grievance policy that functions internally with the anonymous complaints mechanisms that the workers can do, uh, as well as uh, you know, highlighting yet again, both by the Ferro Foundation system and the FLA system, that they have a possibility to do anonymous grievances via the Ferro Foundation hotline and the FLA QQ uh, that's available. Um, so all up, we think that we have done with the tremendous challenge to overcome uh, and with these six brands working together across time zones, across big and small companies, uh, gathering the leverage together and actually in a really rapid and short period of time between April 2018 and October 2018, improving the conditions, you know, overtime is pretty much uh, reduced to legal, uh, legal amounts. Uh, everybody knows how to read their pay slips. Uh, the workers' uh, committees are initiated and have already had their first vis uh, meetings. Uh, and the internal grievance mechanism is now up and running. And management is really on board and realizing that just to, to the point of Ortovox, that they need to listen to the workers because it's a, it's a resource and a scarce resource both in Vietnam but also in China today that workers are leaving for other industries and they need to retain their workforce to survive in the future. So, it's about teamwork, it's about partnership, and we've heard this the last two days, uh, collaboration, working towards one aim to make sure the workers' uh, rights and are listened to and we do care. Um, I'm going to be very... Uh, corner here and do a quote from the verse or a verse of the song which is uh, sort of specified in this whole day. Um, I would have sung it last night but probably I'll read it out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, come delegates and fairware, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway. Don't block up the hall. For he that get hurt will be the one who has stalled. There are, there are challenges outside, and they are all pressing. It'll shake your windows and rattle the walls, for the times, they are changing. Yeah. So. Just a, a few closing remarks on that very beautiful round off. It should have been the end, shouldn't it? But just we feel that uh, giving the workers a voice with the workers committee and collaborating to increase leverage is something that will stay not when, when uh, the, the economy of Hagler's or OSC is changing or when we shift our production. It's truly sustainable change because it comes from inside the factory and from the factory management. So we think it's really important to highlight. And for the 30 years that Kevin has been working with supply chain management, 
you know, he, you've never seen as no, rapid change. No, it's, it, it, it was inspiring. We, uh, we were at ISPO and we were in front of the factory owner and uh, chief executive and we were talking about the issues that we've, uh, Eva's discussed and we had the, I had the confidence to say, we've got some fish behind us here and these people are going to listen and they're going to change what's happening in that factory. And that to me was blew my mind out because we've never had that sort of rapid uh, improvement in the factory. So, uh, yeah, get on and talk to people outside Fairway, inside Fairway, and let's uh, fight the fight together. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Who has a question? Yeah. Several. Okay. See them? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I wondered what was the reaction of the workers, or do you know that there was the reaction of the workers as a brand? The reactions of the workers has, you know, the the cases or the complaints that it started with the challenge of the complaints, right? And it was resolved very, very quickly, and it was also confirmed by these Elevate follow-up audits on a monthly basis afterwards. They have seen that a lot of the OHS issues with blocking up the factories and uh, hiring unskilled workers just to uh, to um, increase capacity has has been quelled because there were some complaints. They come in and they get higher wages than us, but by discussing and negotiating how to go about and how to maybe do subcontracting, but audit also the subcontractor if you inform. The factory. So it, it was it was being outsourced. It was all insourced, and over time was sort of immense. But then some of the brands that we collaborated with said, "Look, we've produced at this factory before, so we will take that. We will do an audit there at the subcontractor." Uh, so all in all, the reactions from workers has just been. Uh, the, the complaints have been closed very quickly and they are confirming via the um, follow-up on the complaints mechanisms that it has been resolved very rapidly and effectively. And in this regard, just a follow-up, uh, were the workers involved in this process and to which extent? So, thank you. They, during, the, during the visits uh, of uh, both Fair Foundation in the audit that was following the complaint, so co first the complaint, then the audit, and then the follow-up audit, and then this factory improvement uh, scheme. The workers have been involved to a certain extent, but it has mainly been to do with the management and via HR to the workers. And the workers' committee meetings that they've had so far, they see that the, um, the workers have been given an opportunity to voice opinions to the management about uh, crowding in the workplace and making sure that they uh, have a safe transport home at night, etc. So there ha the workers' voices have been raised, and I think now that the management, you know, they have an improved dialogue. Yep, we have a question over here. Yeah, really uh, impressive that you managed to collaborate with so many non-fair member brands. I know that's not always that easy to manage, so hats off for that. I'm wondering, did you also have a dialogue among you as brands, how to coordinate your orders and yeah, make sure not all six of you place all your orders in June or whatever the peak season was? These discussions have uh, been been ongoing, of course, because it was uh, you know a reason for the for the um, problem in the beginning. I'm sure. But uh, it's also very important when you work with North American brands, antitrust, you know, you're not allowed to know what sort of business volumes they play. They're much more s secretive in a way with that information. Between, between fair foundation brands, it's like, yeah, how many percent do you have? And good and bad, because you can actually compare, okay, well, but it adds up to being you know, a lot, much more than our leverage is. So it has been a little bit tricky, but the, there has been communication because we have been informed our individual leverages. And I know that these other four brands have received their leverages per month. And we have asked the factory to, to balance it and to see, okay, if it exceeds 100 or 110% of their production capacity, you need to, you know, either shift our orders or do this authorized subcontracting which was then possible with the two of the North American brands. Yeah, one last question. I think I saw one more hand, but if not, then 
Yeah. Here you go. Hi. Sorry. Yeah, it's me again. Um, yeah, so you said when the U.S. told the factory that they should insource instead of outsource, the excessive overtime blew up, meaning that in total the capacity or the orders were like much over capacity. Yeah. But does it also mean that maybe you or some of the brands were outsourcing it or what, did it really go via, still via the subcontractors, but then they were audited? Or if I understood well. I, they, the, 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 pr the production was outsourced. Um, that was the original complaint. Um, but they brought it back in and as uh, Eva says, then the, obviously mm -hmm. the overtime rocketed again. So there was a decision made that instead of saying, well, you don't outsource at all, they were, were going back to the factories, but the factories were then being audited by, I think, the Delivate going um, yep. to, to double check. So they was almost saying, well, you can actually use those now. Um, and obviously the main, the, 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 to get to a point where you say stability, and then once you've got stability, then you can start looking uh, back into the, the main um, headquarters factory. Yeah. I don't know that so the question. They, were, they have one main factory and they have a sister factory. And then those two together had at least 10 outsourcing the factories that they outsourced to. And those were the ones that were not known and, you know, we have made knowledgeable to us that we did not know of. And it was when it was all sort of brought up to the surface that they then insourced into these two factories again. But from these outsourced factories, some of them had actually been working together with the North American brands previously. And there is also a third factory being built in Vietnam from the same suppliers. So by sort of communicating with the management saying this unauthorized is not you know, it's not an option. You need to insource, and then we can then shift a few of the orders to that the North American brands had to one of these outsource factories. Do elevate audit follow-ups on those on sites, and also start to um, shift orders successively to the Vietnamese uh, entity. So in that way, we have been trying to quell the overtime issue uh, while still auditing the factories, and that has been done with then the larger brands. In, in discussion with us, because we have not audited, audited them and we have not done it with Fair Foundation, so we don't feel comfortable in, in having our production there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just a, one clarification. Oh, yeah, sorry, this is a message to you, Andrina, actually. <laughs> you uh, first mentioned before the three points to think about when voting, Yeah. but you mentioned scalability twice. Can you repeat the three points again? I did, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right, now I suddenly remember, but the first one is, is it universal? Mm. And then is it effective and scalable? So universal, not limited to any geographic location or product type. But thanks for um, checking that, because that's an important one. Is it universal? Is it effective? Is it scalable? Thank you so much for these very inspiring <laughs> stories. <laughs> yeah, you can move to the front. And I must say, I'm happy I don't have to vote because it's a hard one. Now, please pick up your phones and make your choice. <laughs> Which of the, of the three should win the Farrah Inspiration Award? Think hard, but not too long. Sorry? <laughs> you can try. I think it only works once. All right, we close in... 10 seconds? You, it doesn't work? Yes, it might refresh. Refresh. Okay, refresh, refresh if, if it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, there are some technical issues. To make sure you can all put in your vote, we're gonna fix that first. So you still have some time to think. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Michael's on yeah. it. Uh, no, she was off the network, so she's back on the network now. Sorry.
Yeah, yeah. Right? you might have to go back on the wireless network. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's close the voting channel. No. Five more seconds. Oh. <laughs> Another five? Yeah. <laughs> you need to connect to the Busmaster network. Onto Wi Fi. Who wants to vote? Who still wants to vote? Yes, everyone voted, those who wanted to vote. You can be Switzerland here as well, but yes. Okay, then it's yeah. closed now. It is, yeah. And yeah. the award will now be prepped. So meanwhile, as our wonderful graphic <laughs> designer is going to fix all that, I would like to um, ask the Associate Director of Fair Foundation, Margreet Frieling, to join me on stage. Thank you. Welcome. So this is a very exciting moment for all of us. I said, maybe let's come a bit more yeah. to the center. <laughs> Yesterday, I said at the member day, inspire, learn and get inspired. And here we have three examples of activities that deserve to be in the spotlight and that I hope are inspirational for all of you. And only one <laughs> will get an award. <laughs> and who will that be today? The Fairware Foundation Inspirational Award of 2018. So people are now <laughs> working very hard to extract the figures that you have been voting on. So soon we will know who will get this new inspirational award. Exciting. <laughs> Drum rolls. I and it's interesting, I think, to see that you all tackled your approach from a very different angle, a very different approach, actually. And uh, you tackled your problem with a very different approach. It's interesting. That I it's think it's so interesting, indeed. It's, it's three very different approaches. One from starting at your brand, sitting, well, we want to do, we want to take this journey. The other one starting from a complaint and you starting in the factory with a factory manager, having an idea of we want to do things differently. And all three of them show actually what Fairware stands for, is that all actors and all participants in the supply chain are needed to make a change. You all took a different journey and I think they all should be in the spotlight today, and it's nice that you have been able to pitch it so that you know all the stories. And as said, one, and who will that be, <laughs> will so we'll receive the award and also the, the possibility to, same as that we've seen uh, from uh, the example of the award uh, last year, Skyfans, to receive a video. Yeah. Can I see? Yeah. Can you do this? Yes. Okay, so I will do it one by one. First, to hand out a check, so I know the answer already. <laughs> the winner of the Fair Foundation Inspiration Award 2018 is... <laughs> Hagnos and OSC. <laughs> <laughs> well so congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank so you. this is a nice end of your inspirational journey. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> this goes together with it. Yes. So lots of success and I hope this story will inspire others to work on worker complaints as well. Woo! Woo! Yes. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank and uh, yeah, collaboration Bye. rules. It's what I keep saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One more. Uh, thank, you. thank you. So maybe one last word. What do you intend to do with the video profile? Do you have any wild ideas? No, because uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this was just, uh, you know, a long shot. And uh, with uh, such worthy competitors, no. I did not think we would win. So <laughs> thank you, everybody. We have to think about it. Okay, well.
curious to hear more about that. Okay, yeah. one more <laughs> applause. Thank you. Yes, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another picture. Well, we've come to the end of today. I'd like to ask Alexander Kohenstam to come with some closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Andy. I... Yeah, it's working. Thank you so much. I, this is a, I didn't even win anything I'm in, I'm in this place. You should all come up later here. It's an amazing sensation to be uh, in, the, in this confetti. It's really nice. Um, so, uh, thank you all. Uh, for, for being here today, participating. I think we, we worked really hard on the, on the agenda for change. Many topics uh, were, were discussed and subsequent, subsequently also debated at the tables um, as well. There's one topic, though, that can never be discussed enough, can never get enough attention, and that is social dialogue. I think the winning case just now also showed that. Um, so social dialogue, based on freedom of association, um, is an, an enabling right. Uh, I think that's the, the word that we, uh, that we should use. It's an enabling right because it's a basic precondition for all other rights to be implemented. Um, and in that sense, it's implicit. But that doesn't mean that uh, it, should be, it shouldn't be made explicit. It should be made explicit because the rights of unions are being trampled in most or all of the countries that we work in. Um, it doesn't mean that we should not make it explicit because in um, most cases, workers are not free to organize. And we should make it explicit because our brands, you, have a role to play. So Fairware will work on that um, with our union partners, FNV and CNV, here in, in the Netherlands, as well as with the union partners and their partners in uh, production countries. And it starts with joint learning. Learning the dynamics of brands, um, unions, uh, governments, factories, and workers, um, and with our SP partners, we're financing an important uh, project at Cornell University to do exactly that. Finally, it's also something I will personally work on because I really like to learn. So, thank you, thanks everybody. I would particularly like to thank um, two people, Maike for organizing this. She will be thanked again. <laughs> And of course, and of course, Hendrine, and Hendrine knows, and she will tell you that there are many more people involved. Um, but thank you, Hendrine, you've been great. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Well, thank you all. It's been a wonderful day, a very long day, but also I think a very inspiring day. And without the input of all of you, we couldn't have done this. And I think, yeah, you're going to hear so much more um, of the input that you gave for this agenda for change. So to be continued. Now, um, yeah, there are uh, several people and organizations that we'd like to thank in particular. A very special thanks to Tertium for the design of the program. It's been a great help. Thank you so much, Natasha. Bureau Rust for again creating fantastic graphic designs to support the content and so much more. Fantastic. Idealists for the logistics of the day and everything around that. Did a great job. And thank you, Vilm, for filming this entire day. And there are many more. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the Farah Foundation staff for organizing this entire conference. And there are several people that I want to mention explicitly. That's Ellen, Sarah, Sophie, Lotta, Alexander, 
and Miss Annual Conference. So I'd like to thank you again, Maike. Now it's time to have a drink at the bar, but while you move yourselves over to the bar, I'd like to save you some annoying evaluation emails, and I'd like to ask you to, for the very last time, pick up your phones and answer the three final Buzzmaster questions. Please do so, because it'll help us a lot to learn and improve. And then, let's go to the bar. Thank you so much.